most entertaining, but also sometimes the most frustrating aspects of racing is trying to come up with ways to improve your car and make it faster while staying within the rule book. Now, it's easy to go down the route of spending a ton of money and wasting a lot of time trying to figure out ways to do that, but when you get it right, it's a really satisfying feeling. Now back in the video where I explained a lot of the technical aspects of the USRA B mod, I mentioned that there wasn't really anything all that special about the engine. It was just kind of a basic small block Chevy. Now, I'm sure you guys know that that's not entirely true. There's a lot of things that go into making that engine reliably turn the RPMs that it needs to turn and make the power that it needs to make in order to compete in a class this competitive. So with that in mind, we're going to look at some of the details, some of the parts that go into it, and some of the things that we do to the engines to make more horsepower, more reliably, and make them more competitive. Our B-Mod engines are capable of turning 7,000 RPM, despite the fact that they're running a two-barrel carburetor and a dual-plane intake. So in order to be able to reliably turn that kind of RPM, there's a lot of things that have to go on in the top end of the motor to make them reliable. But first, let's start off with just looking at the cylinder heads themselves. Now, we can run a stock GM cylinder head, but if we do that, we're restricted to running heads from the smog era that really don't flow all that well and are starting to get hard to find out on the used market. So with that in mind, a lot of people have switched, myself included, to running these stock replacement heads. Now we have, on this side over here, we've got the dart cylinder head that we're allowed to run. And on this side, we've got the EQ cylinder head. And they have some things that are similar, but some things that are different. Starting off looking at the combustion chamber, the dart heads have a really nice heart-shaped combustion chamber, it makes for a more efficient burn of the fuel and helps those make more power. Whereas the EQ heads have more of like the bathtub shaped combustion chamber that would be more typical of like the smog era heads that we're allowed to run. So in order to kind of balance that out and keep, uh, you know, keep things competitive, depending on what head people choose, the, the ports on the dart are quite a bit smaller compared to the ports on the EQ. It's actually a 165 cc intake port versus 185 cc intake port, which if you know much about building engines or if you've ever messed around with say stuff for a you know, less restrictive class or like drag racing or whatever, you know that is a really tiny intake port. So these heads are really choked down and it makes it difficult to get a lot of power out of them. One other thing I should mention is that we're allowed to run a maximum valve size of 2.02 .02 on the intake and 1.6 on the exhaust. These dart heads come already cut for those sizes, whereas the EQs come with a 1.94 and 1.5 inch valve respectively. So in order to make these compete for our class, it's best to cut them for bigger valves, which these had that done. Uh, while the EQ head is a little bit cheaper as a bare head, the extra work that you have to put into it kind of makes it come out about as a wash. Now let's take a look at some of the parts that go on to the cylinder heads. So right here we have a couple of valve spring retainers. This black one here is just a, basically like a stock replacement. It's just a, a really basic one off of Speedway, really cheap. This one here is a GM Performance Tool Steel valve spring retainer. Now the idea behind the tool steel is that it's stronger but it's not as strong as like titanium or something like that, but we're not allowed to run titanium. So with it being a, a stronger material, you can use less of it. So you see about 22 grams for the standard steel retainer versus about 15 and a half grams for the tool steel retainer. So that's less reciprocating weight and allows for better valve control. Let's look at the valves themselves. This one is just like a, a stock, well, it is a racing valve, uh, but it's from either Summit or Speedway. I'm not uh, sure exactly on this exact one, but it's a, you know, the, basically the cheapest racing valve you can buy. That's, uh, that's an exhaust valve and weighs about 100 grams. Compare that to this valve here, which is a hollow stem valve. It's actually been gun drilled and then filled back over by Faria. 88 grams, so you're you know saving almost 15 grams there, just 
in one valve alone. And that equates to you know, having a lighter, again, reciprocating mass, better valve control, better reliability. The downside being these lightweight parts cost about four times as much as the basic equivalent. So here we've got one of the push rods that we run. This is a heavy wall push rod. And you may be wondering why we go through so much effort, spend so much money to lighten the valve train and then run a heavy push rod. Well, the reason behind that is if you run a lightweight push rod with a thinner wall, it can flex more. It actually, that's like a pogo stick. It can vault the valve off of the seat and create valve float that way. Right here, we've got one of the rocker arms that we have to run. It's, uh, it's basically like a stock style rocker, but with a roller tip. We're not allowed to run full roller rockers. And that's one of the major weak spots of these engines. Now you can't, this one, you know, doesn't have too many nights on it, but you can already see the bluing starting to happen from heat. And over time, these will break, so they have to be replaced fairly often. In order to mitigate that, we run oil deflectors, such as this Moroso one. These actually mount to the rocker studs and sit over the top of the rockers to deflect oil back onto the, onto the rocker and spring and keep them cool. So looking at the other side of the head here, we see our screw-in studs that we use for the rockers. That's, uh, you know, that's one advantage to running these aftermarket heads is they're already drilled and tapped for a screw-in stud, so you don't have the expense of converting a stock head that has a press-in stud to the screw-in. In addition to being screw-in, these are also 7 16 diameter versus the stock 3 8 and that reduces the amount of flex in the, in the rocker helps keep it from breaking and also helps keep the valve train more stable. So I've talked a lot about the cylinder head technology, but there's also a lot that goes into the rotating assembly on these engines. Uh, this here is the one of the pistons out of my primary motor, not the one that blew up. This is a manly forged piston that's specifically designed for a two barrel class. These are only good for about 450 horsepower because they're so light and so almost underbuilt but we have to run a flat top piston, so these have the smallest valve reliefs that they can get away with. And they've basically just removed as much weight as possible out of the piston to reduce, again, reciprocating weight. And in this case, allow the engine to rev up more quickly. You'll also see that this piston has a much thinner and tighter ring pack than a standard piston. That reduces the friction and also allows for better sealing to create less blow by. Well, there you have it. Some of the technology that goes into a B-Mod engine to allow them to rev higher and make more power than you would expect out of something with a two-barrel carburetor, a simple dual-plane intake, and really not that great of a cylinder head, actually. So going forward, I'm going to build two engines this winter. One is going to be putting back together my primary engine, which I took apart for a rebuild, and the other is going to be replacing the backup engine, which was the engine that blew up in our engine catastrophic failure video. So I'm going to go through that process with you guys, show you what it takes to put one of these engines together yourself in a garage. I think it's something that just about every racer could do, and there's reasons why you should do it, so we'll get into that later. In the meantime, I hope you enjoyed the video. You know, please subscribe, like, all that good stuff. Also check us out, Ross Racing 64 on Facebook, and uh, yeah, hope you have a good one.